Oh, I'm gonna fuck up these French pronunciations. God damn it. Hey y'all, my name is Mesa and welcome back to my book channel. Today we are gonna be discussing Blood and Honey by Shelby Mahurin. This is the second book of the Serpent and Dove series. So if you haven't read Serpent and Dove, get the fuck out of here. And if you're still reading Blood and Honey or you haven't finished it, also get the fuck out of here because I'm gonna be spoiling everything in this book. I'm just gonna, we're deep diving. So um, yeah, get out of here so I can start the spoiler section. Are you gone? Okay, you're gone? Okay, perfect. Let's do this shit. I am outside again, so sorry for any outside noises. You know how it is. So Ansel dies. Yeah, we're just, we're diving right in. I ain't stopping at all. We're just gonna address the elephant in the room. Ansel dies. That was the big major character death. I thought it was gonna be Reed or some shit, but we'll get, we'll get to all that later. So the book picks off right where we left off in Serpent and Dove. We are back in the forest. La Foy des you. We're in the forest where they are hiding from Morgan. Rita's just rescued Lou and they're hiding from her right now. While in the forest, Morgan leaves a letter for Lou in a form of a riddle and Lou and the rest of the gang kind of interpret it as she is going to attack during the Archbishop's funeral. So they have to haul ass and get to the capital. How the fuck do you pronounce the capital's name? I don't, I'm just gonna put it right here. This is the capital's name. Y'all know what it is. All right, we'll move on. But not only do they have to haul as to the capital, they have to form alliances. And the two alliances that they want to form are with the Dam Rouge and the Werewolf. So essentially their plan is to make alliances to get to the Archbishop's funeral and stop whatever Morgan has planned. So on their journey there, they stop at this tavern to get information because they don't know when the Archbishop's funeral is at. So they have to figure out the date and just any other information that they can while they're at this bar. While they're at this bar slash tavern thing, um, someone recognizes Lou because at this point, Bo has completely fucking ruined her hair. Now she has moonbeam hair like her mother. And that's like a staple hair color. Like most people that see that know like, oh my God, like that's like the main witch. That's the witch bitch. And then they look at Lou and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the witch bitch's daughter. <laughs> Basically the whole thing kind of like goes up in flames. But the person that helps them his name is Claude Devereaux. They met him at the bar. He comes back for them, you know, and helps them out of there. We find out that he is actually in charge of this traveling troupe of performers. Here's the new plan. Because the Dam Roges will not allow Reed into their camp because he's a huntsman, so they have to split up. So Lou, Coco, and Ansel go to the Dam Roges camp, and Reed, his mom, and Bo go with the troop. And so we kind of separate at that point. So with Reed, he's just doing some circus shit. He's throwing knives. He's contemplating his existence of being a witch. It's like, it's dramatic. That's basically what happens there. Not a lot. He's just kind of like wrestling with like, oh my gosh, I'm not a witch. I am a witch. I don't want that part of me. I just like, like annoying as fuck. I was really annoyed with Reed throughout this whole motherfucking book. Same thing with Lou. Both of them were really irritating to me for some reason, but like, and then Lou, Coco, and Ansel, they have more of an intense time, to say the least. So um, right now, the Damroges, they are looking for one of their lost sons who has been kidnapped by Morgan. And Lou, she says, hey, listen, if I find your missing son, can we be allies? Because at this point, Josephine, also known as La Voisin, she is the one in charge of the Damroges. She is kind of like the Morgan of the Damroges. Essentially, Josephine says, hell no, I'm not going against Morgan. I am not forming this alliance. I'm not suicidal. Like, no. While Lou's there and they're trying to find this missing boy, his sister is with Lou and she starts to learn more about the damn Roach magic because she's a little girl, her name is Gabriella. She was just like excited to talk to someone about her magic and she just was like just blabbering off about it. So we learned a lot of the Roach magic through her. And we also find out that she is one of Reed's half siblings. The boy that they're looking for is Reed's half brother as well. And this is the point where Lou starts to realize, oh my God, my mother is now hunting King August's children separately. 
because that was the whole point of Lou needing to be sacrificed. Morgan found a pattern through their magic that if she killed her own child, she would kill all the children from Augustine. And so that was the point. But now Morgan's like, fuck this. I'm just going to individually find them. There's 27 children, according to Madame Label, that she has found so far. And that's Morgan's goal. She wants to completely wipe King August's line because he's the main person who has persecuted and executed witches. And while they're searching for this son, they find his body and they're at his funeral. But at his funeral, Morgan kidnaps Gabriella. And at that point, Josephine is just like, fuck it, we are joining you. I'm not losing any more children. I'm not having any more of my witches suffer. Yes, we'll join you. So boom, that alliance locked in. Let's talk about the Dam Rouge magic. Their magic comes from within, whereas the Dam Blancs, it comes from the earth, which is why they use their blood. But we learned that like tears, especially Coco's tears, are intense. Like literally like she can cry and like a fire will start. Like wherever the tears hit, fires will start. Which I thought was like, oh, that's pretty badass. She has to be really careful with her emotions though. Cause imagine just crying and you're like hugging someone and then you have tears accidentally fall and you're just essentially like burning their skin off. Like now let's head back to Reed. Like I said before, he's doing circus shit. But while he's doing circus shit, he actually meets two twins who are men who have magic as well. So he's not the only one. So like I said before, he is struggling with himself in his view of magic, but it's also affecting his view of Lou. But through his eyes, he is seeing Lou lose herself in the magic. And by lose herself, I mean like she is starting to do what her mother did. And her mother is now completely off the deep end. Like there's no saving her. But the more you give to magic, the more you lose of yourself. That's how the damn Blanc's magic works. Lou and Reed and their gang join back up. Shit happens in this town. They're attacked, Baz is there. It's just a whole thing. More stuff to kind of like throw in the fire of Reed and Lou's relationship that's kind of already like tanking right now. So now they're off to the werewolf's land to get that alliance. <laughs> but the catch is, um, <laughs> Reed killed the Alpha's son. Yeah, so Reed killed the Alpha's son and that's what promoted him to captain when he was still a chasser. So, mm, fun shit. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong, right? Wrong, absolutely fucking everything went wrong. Um, so finally they make it to La Ventre, which is the territory of the werewolves. And they are completely surrounded by the werewolves. The werewolves ain't taking shit. They're like, nah, fuck your alliance. Reed, we're hunting you. Run, motherfucker, let's do this. And Reed's kind of just like, he accepts it because he's like, okay, like what else can I do? So basically he just has to run to this village and if he gets there without them hunting him, then he won, they won't kill him. But Lou can't help him at all. Like no magic can be used. Of course, um, Lou doesn't listen to that. And she like just sweeps the whole forest in like this like winter wonderland and is attacking the Alpha's other children. And I'm just like, girl, and then out of the fucking blue, the Chassers fucking like come through. They see Lou and like the werewolves like fighting. And of course, the John Luke is with them. And then there's that whole little like fiasco thing. And then Lou steals his basilica. Basilica. But that's it. That's... I'll put the word right here. And while that's all going on with Lou and John Luke, Blaze, the Alpha, finds Reed and they have this really intense conversation where basically Blaz is just like, yeah, so when you killed my son, um, my husband killed himself. So uh, fucking thank you for that. And it's just kind of like, like you really see the consequences of your actions. Because at this point, Reed did not view them as like individuals at all. He viewed them as evil, having no emotions. Throughout this whole book, he's really confronted with the fact that like all that I did as a chasser, most of it was really, really bad because he in his head, like I said, viewed all these people as evil when in reality he's learning he's like oh shit they're just like me anyway they're having this weird combo right kind of making reed really uncomfortable good he needs to hear it but then blaze hears his youngest son like screaming bloody murder and so they both just take off the fuck back to where lou and jean luc are at they get there it's chaos there's like they're like there's like a block of ice right where lou and jean luc are at there's like chassers on all sides there's 
bow, Coco and Ansel hitting like, like, Luke, get the fuck out, get the fuck out. And then basically it all ends and the youngest son of Blaze is injured and Reed's just like, I know what to do. He grabs this jar of blood and honey that Coco gave him for when, you remember from when he got his stomach ripped open. Oh, did I forget to mention that? Yeah, when Baze shows up and you know, that whole little fiasco with like the robbers and stuff, yeah. Reed gets like his stomach ripped open, it's like whatever. So the mixture of blood and honey is this healing substance that heals the body, heals wounds, and so he gives that to the son. And that's kind of like a true, like, okay, thank you. You saved my son. I will now in turn not kill you. But Blaze still does not want to join the Alliance. It's his kids, his daughter and his son that are like, no, we're in debt to Reed now. Because Reed just saved one of us. So through his kids, he is now part of the Alliance. He's like, well, fuck, I'm not gonna allow my kids to just go off and like face Morgan by themselves. So now they have three werewolves and the Damroges. So they make it to the capital, Cesarine, and while they're there, Lou and Reed have this huge fight. And I mean like huge, it's probably the biggest they've had so far. And after that chapter, I was kind of like, did they break up? It was really weird. Basically Lou's like, why don't you accept me? You'll never fucking accept me. You hate magic, you hate me. And then Reed's like, no, I just don't want you to get lost in it, blah, blah. And it basically ends with Reed saying the most dumbest shit ever, saying that she is like her mom. When I tell you I wanted to like full sock read in the face at that moment, oh boy. So there's trouble in paradise. Immediately after, Reed, Bo, and his mom, Madame Label, they go to see the king and convince him to join their alliance. Of course it doesn't motherfucking go well. Like, like Bo told them, you know, Bo, it's his dad. He lived with him. Like, hey, I know my dad, he's not gonna wanna join. And of course Bo was correct. King August throws their as in a cell completely drugs Reed and his mom because they're witches. Bo is like all tied up with like chasters right there. Every time he speaks, they smack him on the head. Like it's, it's not a good situation. Basically in this scene, King Augustine proves that he's an awful person. Why did they try to make him join an alliance? He hates witches, doesn't matter if his kid Reed is one, he doesn't give a fuck. His only priority is to spite Morgan. And he literally was just like, I will fuck every single woman in order to spite Morgan. And I was just like, okay, cool. And he says, and he's saying this all in front of his wife, by the way, which I'm just like, oh my gosh, I can't even. <clears throat> King August is just like, okay, I want Lou. Lou's the key to fucking up Morgan. So yeah, uh, King August, um, not a good person. I could have like told told you all that before but whatever and he's just like an asshole because reed does realize that like yeah i lost like the mental version that i made up of my father but then he's like but Bo legit lost his dad like this wasn't just an imagination Bo completely just lost his dad because his dad's like fuck you you know but then Bo's twin sisters come to the rescue violette and victoire they have the keys they unlock it and it's just like there's a sweet interaction between Bo and his twin sisters it was really fucking cute i really want to see more of them hopefully in the next book because just like being Bo as an older brother i don't know something in my heart i was just like but unfortunately the rescue is kind of short-lived the chassers realize what the fuck the twins did and they're racing back so madame Leabelle basically sacrifices herself up to get captured so that Bo and Reed can get away. Fast forward a little bit, it is now the Archbishop's funeral and Lou and Reed are watching from their window cell. And before this scene, they do make up, so trouble in paradise is no longer trouble anymore. So they kind of rekindled, they've talked. And so they're watching his funeral, the parade of his funeral from the window of their inn. And in this moment, Reed is getting flashbacks, memories back to the Archbishop. And we are basically essentially seeing the deep relationship that Reed had with the Archbishop. And in the end, he is finally able to grieve and let go. He no longer has the Archbishop's death looming over him. But with this funeral, there's no Morgan attack. Like Morgan is not attacked at all. There's no trace of her. They're like, what the fuck happened? Happened. Morgan leaves Lou another note which essentially says she plans on attacking during the Skull Masquerade. And the Skull Masquerade takes place under the city, under the underground tunnels. And so they're just like, fuck, because the underground tunnels are so massive, so she could literally be anywhere. Not only is she gonna attack during the masquerade, she has Celie as hostage. And because of that, Jean-Luc is now with their little gang because like him and Celie are kind of like a thing now. So he kind of joins their rank just for that moment. 
So at this moment, we learn that Coco can predict someone's future. Coco did this before in Serpent and Dove, but essentially she tastes Lou's blood and she's able to see her future. And what Coco sees is death. And she says to Lou, by the stroke of midnight, a man close to your heart will die. And instantly I'm like, oh goddamn, Reed, Reed's gonna die. Which other man is like closer to her heart, right? Like I was like, for sure, I'm like, oh my God, Reed's gonna die. There it is, fuck. And Lou thought the same thing too. And Lou is scared for Reed because she knows that Reed is still gonna go after Seeley because it's not in him to not rescue someone, to not help when he knows he can. Because it's underground, there is a door in there in that leads down to the tunnels. And so essentially what Lou does is she uses magic and she wards the door so that no one but her can go through. So she has locked everyone out. And Reed is fuming, man. Ooh, he, mm. So they have to find another way to get to the underground tunnels because he's like, fuck, my wife is down there. Shit, by herself facing her mom. So they find another way that they have to go through the catcombs. Like I understood where Lou was coming from, but she, it was, it was a pretty fucking stupid move. So you think you can like face your mom, honey? Like, but Lou has locked them out and she's gonna go find Cecily. And so she comes to the catcombs, Ansel comes down, he follows her. He was forced to stay behind. He was seen as a liability by Reed. And so he kind of just like waited, then tried the door again where Lou's magic was at. And he was able to get through because she was like too far away or something to keep it going. I don't, I don't remember. And basically Lou's like, fuck, I don't want him down here because he could possibly get killed. She basically spits at him being like, you are a disappointment. Just like, don't say that to my baby to my son. But Ansel stands his ground. He's like, no, I am staying here. I am helping. You cannot bully me out of here. And at that moment, I was like, my son is standing up for himself. So he stays and they find Cecily. They, they find Cecily in her sister's casket and her sister's body has not decayed yet. So on the side of her face is her sister's flesh and when I tell you when I read that scene that I can I had to set the book down I'm like that is so fucking gross that oh Ansel threw up Lou threw up it was just oh gosh fast forward a couple of chapters they find themselves in this auditorium where Morgan has the dead bodies of King August's children circling the fuck around her and literally that image I'm like wow that's so sick and evil but that's the scene we're setting right so Lou and and Ansel are there they're kind of like trying to face her off but then Reed and gang come blazing through and so they're all there and then Morgan is kind of just like wait you and she's pointing to Claude Devereaux and so we find out that Claude Devereaux is the wood woos and the wood woos is the wild he is the god of the wild his sister is the triple goddess the goddess that Morgan and all the damn Blancs worship. And so I'm just like, they've been walking in the presence of an immaculate being this whole time and they didn't know. Cause throughout the book, that was something that Lou was kind of like trying to figure out. She's just like, what are you? Like, you don't seem like a witch, but what the fuck are you? Because you're definitely not, not just human. Like you're not normal. Like what the fuck are you? And we find out, well, sweetie, um, he's the woodworse. So, and the Woodworth tells Morgan, you need to stop this shit that you're doing. The Triple Goddess is sick of it. The way that you're going about avenging the deaths of your sisters is not okay. And you are forbidden from hunting Lou. And so I'm like, oh, perfect, great, awesome. It's gonna end happy, right? No. The Woodworth tells Morgan to leave. So while she's leaving, Ansel is near her path and she does one last spiteful thing to infuriate Lou and to torture her, she stabs Ansel in the back of the head, killing him. And in this moment, Lou just, she only sees like red, she like tunnel vision, just her mom. She's screaming, like she completely is just like in distraught and she fucking takes off after her mom and she's planning on bringing the whole tunnels down 
to kill Morgan. Coco is also in distress and she starts crying and through her tears she is burning up the auditorium and Coco had the same idea she was chasing after Morgan too but then Morgan disappears and Lou, Reed, and the gang turn around to see that the auditorium is up in flames. That is where his body is going to lay rest. He's gonna burn with the auditorium. And at this moment, we see that Lou is starting down, like legit starting down the path of losing herself in her magic. That she does not care what the consequences are to her. She wants revenge. She wants to burn down the Chateau de Blanc, which is the home of Dan Blancs and where she grew up. So we're at the end of the book and Lou, Josephine and Nicolina, they're talking and Lou's essentially like, hey, I wanna fucking burn my home to the ground, you in or not. And then we find out Josephine and Nicolina are in leagues with Morgan. Am I surprised? No, not at all. I had a really sneaky suspicion when we met Josephine that she was so defiant on not joining Lou that when she kind of like completely turned, like even though they did lose one of the damn Roge's children, I still didn't see that as sufficient enough for Josephine to want to take Morgan head on. And I was right. So, so they give Lou this potion, which we are left to assume controls her. And I'm already to quote, this is what Josephine is telling Lou. By decree of the goddess, Morgan can no longer hunt you. She cannot force you to do anything against your will. You must go to her willingly. You must sacrifice yourself willingly. I would simply feed you my blood to assume control, but the pure, unadulterated blood of an enemy kills. She gestured to Nikolai's blood on my face, to my ravaged skin. Fortunately, I have an alternate solution. It's all thanks to you, Louise. The rules of old magic are absolute. An impure spirit such as Nikolai's cannot touch a pure one. This darkness in your heart, it calls to us. What the fuck does that quote mean? Hold on. That quote is essentially saying that Nicolina is going to possess Lou's body. That's what it's saying. And I'm really excited to see the logistics of that in Serpent and Dove 3, because I really want to know like, what the fuck? like. It is wild. And so they control her and essentially we're left to believe that they are going to deliver her to Morgan under the noses of Reed and Coco and Bo. The book literally ends with Lou flinging herself onto Reed and kissing him, which is really out of character that like she hasn't smiled since Ansel's death and now all of a sudden she's coming through all smiley giggly giving him kisses. It's, it was, it was off but we end with it that way. That's how the book ends. And there's a theory that I've seen going around that's saying that like when Lou is kissing Reed, that's actually Nicolina in her because right before there, Nicolina literally says, pretty mouse, we shall taste your huntsman. We shall have our kiss. <laughs> and I'm like, and we find out that Nicolina is a wrath. And I'm not sure about in the Serpent and Dove universe, but what if Nicolina is inside of Lou? And that's why she like grows up to him and gives him this big kiss because she literally is just like, I'm gonna have my kiss now, like, Ooh. So that was kind of like the overarching plot and events in the book. Of course, a lot more happened that I didn't cover, but those were kind of just like the events that kind of stuck with me. My overall thoughts in the book, I was really underwhelmed while reading this. I was, it's actually kind of really disappointing because I, this is one of my most anticipated reads of the second half of 2020 and it really did not live up to the expectation that it was held at. It didn't personally live up to my expectations. Serpent and Dove was an amazing book so I was super excited for Blood and Honey but Blood and Honey everything was so predictable. I was able to predict almost everything, nothing surprised me. Whereas in Serpent and Dove everything surprised me, that's what made it great. I was just like what? Like everything was unpredictable, it was amazing. But in Blood and Honey, that wasn't the case. None of the choices the characters made surprised me. Ansel dying didn't surprise me. I think it's because Shelby Mahurin, during one of her interviews, announced that there was gonna be a major character death in Blood and Honey, so I was waiting for that. Whereas if I didn't know that, if I didn't watch that interview, I wouldn't have known. I was anticipating it. Whereas if I didn't anticipate it, it would have hit like, what? he died but i was like yeah he he died and because he died and she announced it was a major character death i wish he would have been more prevalent in this book he almost has no significance in this book besides being there besides like 
the weird kind of like relationship thing with Coco that doesn't end up well. Just it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Something else that I didn't even think about, but I'm on this like Facebook group chat and there was this discussion which I'm just like, why didn't I think of that? The discussion was how unbelievable the introduction of new mythical creatures were because we didn't know about them in Serpent and Dove. So them being like introduced into the second book wasn't believable, like the werewolves. Then there's like mermaids. It just wasn't believable. And I didn't think about it until someone mentioned it, but I'm like, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't buying it. And another thing, who else thought that we were gonna be at the Damn Roses camp a lot longer than we were? We were there for like, what, a few chapters? And then we were gone. I don't know why, but it seemed as though Blood and Honey was kind of set up as though the Damroges were gonna be this huge force, like this huge major plot in the story. And they weren't, like they really weren't. We only follow Coco and her aunt and then Nicolina and that's like it. And Nicolina's not even a blood witch. One more thing, there was this plot hole in the story that I was kind of just like, and it was with magic. So you're telling me that the Dam Blancs and the Dam Roges didn't know that men inherited magic. And that's why Reed was the exception, right? That's what we were all thinking. But then Reed meets other men that have magic. You can't tell me, like, it does not make sense, especially the Dam Blancs, that like Morgan would not know that. Mm, that's such a major plot hole. With the resources that the Dam Blancs and the Dam Roges have, it's just not believable to me that none of them would have known that men can inherit magic. And we were made to believe that Reed was truly this exception, but it turns out in Blood and Honey, he's just the norm, which is so unfortunate because the story could have been so much more unique, so much more rich if she just left it as Reed being this exception. And then we kind of are exploring why, but her making him the norm, it's like Shelby threw that away. It's just like, why did we even go there? It just didn't make sense to me and it's really upsetting. Also the cliffhanger it ends on, um, people who read the arcs are just like, oh my gosh, the cliffhanger it ends on, it's intense, it's whoa, it just felt like the end of a book to me. It really didn't feel like a cliffhanger. Serpent and Dove ended on a cliffhanger, this it kind of just ends on of like, okay, yeah, that's where a book would naturally end. What's gonna happen in book three? It was just so underwhelming and I feel bad saying that. I really wanted to enjoy this book. Also, I felt like there was like, there was action, but it almost felt like filler action everything in this book felt like it was put there just to keep the story going and not because it actually flowed with the story which was disappointing i did hear that i'm not sure if this is correct or not that serpent and dove was only supposed to be a duology and then it turned into a trilogy so that could have something to do with it i don't know i the only thing that i really really enjoyed in this book was Bo. i oh Bo made me so happy during this whole book. Literally, that's what I kept reading for. I'm like, come on. I really hope he has a bigger part in Serpent and Dove 3. I oh, please, please. Bo losing his virginity story made me lose my shit. I was just like, ah. Oh. Like literally he had a really bad stutter when he was younger and he happened to have sex with someone for the first time who like stutters were her turn on, but he didn't know that wasn't normal. So when he's hooking up with this boy from one of his classes or something and he starts to like stutter something, he realized the hard way, oh shit, most people aren't turned on by that. And I was like, Bo! <laughs> like that, just Bo in general. <sighs> that was my favorite part, just Bo, that's Bo. Let me know what you think, if you guys were underwhelmed by this book as well, or if you really enjoyed it. We all have different opinions. For me, I was just really underwhelmed, felt like everything was predictable. Let me know what you think down below. I'm Mesa, thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, you can give it a thumbs up and you can subscribe if you want to. You don't gotta. Bye. So I have like four copies of Blood and Honey and it's really disappointing that I didn't enjoy the book. Four fucking copies of a book that I was underwhelmed, a book that I was disappointed in. I have four fucking copies. So I have a book box with a special edition cover. I have a signed copy. I have a personalized signed copy. And now I have an ebook of it because the earliest one of my copies was coming was in a week and I couldn't wait a week. So I bought the ebook, four copies, four copies of a book that isn't my favorite. Isn't that wild?
I'm still mad that Ansel's dead, but I'm really, really mad that it didn't surprise me. I'm friends with the person who runs the account Lou Diggory on Instagram, and they like did this poll questionnaire thing where they asked, who do you think's gonna die in Blood and Honey? And majority of the people said Ansel, and I was just like, and they were right. Like that's how predictable it was. It pisses me off.